Greetings, dear ones, I'm Cryon of Magnetic Service. This is the third channeling of five. In the series, over two days, which is the study, profound study, of core truth that is presented upon that which you are calling the Lemurian teaching wheel. We've referred to it in the past, long before we referred to Lemurian as the teaching wheel. It's synonymous with the beauty of all that is that could be shown to a human being about the relationship and the beauty even of the exposure of the human soul. The teaching started off with the nomenclature, the energies, the missing information potentials, and all the things that perhaps you will discover later about what the teaching truly was. Imagine sitting in front of an angel and an angel item by item starts to explain who you are. The list brings you to the God human teaching. In the wheel we call it the God human spoke of the wheel. The spokes always lead from the outer to the middle and to the middle to the outer. This in itself is the metaphor that everything points to the center. And the center of all things in the teaching is always that mysterious thing to you, which we wish to also demystify, which is called spirit, God, creator. But in this particular spoke, you have the subject that Kryon has spoken of since the beginning. The one that's going to anchor humanity eventually there is no most important one, but there could be the most important one for a region or a time or a place. And that is because it's interactive with the, with the energies that humans create. The God human spoke is the story of the relationship between the human being and the creator of the universe. Humanity is beginning to change its consciousness. Part of consciousness change is maturity, growing into concepts that you did not practice before. Dear ones, most of the concepts of the teaching wheel have been around for a very long time, but so many have been sequestered to the shamans or the, the holy women and men. Not things that are practiced in the general public, but that are seen as such pristine ideas that you will then stop and report to a building so you can be refreshed by those in charge who would know what they were. Suddenly we are saying that these core teachings belong to each human. And they exist in each human. And a higher consciousness, an evolving consciousness, means that more human beings are starting to remember the core truths. Remembering requires that you were exposed to them at least one time. And that's what the story of Lemuria has become, as well as the teachings in every node of the planet. For the Pleiadians taught core truth carefully so that you had free choice to accept or ignore. The consciousness of humanity in itself generally is starting to shift. An older consciousness is quite authoritarian, militaristic, if you might say, extending right into the family. It wasn't that long ago that even families were taught to practice the very thing you see in ancient governments and in the military. 
And it goes like this. Don't let the troops or the children or the citizens think for themselves. Because if they do, there will be rebellion. And so the best thing to do is to keep a lid on their thinking. In the military, it's worked well because you fight battles. And you don't need free thinkers. You need those who obey. That's when you fight battles. But so much of the consciousness of the planet has been considered as a battle. You battle each other, the country to country, thought to thought, group to group, corporation to corporation. You're all in a battle. That's changing. The whole idea of competing thought is changing. You're starting to have a concept of a meld, a confluence of energy, where you start to consider not com competition and and not separation. But the idea that togetherness may actually create something far, far better. And you're right. How is that going to change then? Who you are? It's going to change everything, dear ones. If you stop the idea of true competition and winner takes all, that changes your government, doesn't it? What about corporates? That changes that. Product competition, that changes that. You're going to start realizing something. And that these new energies that are starting to come together are creating more than the whole of the sum. In other words, there's added energy with compassion. There's some things you don't expect with cooperation gentleness, patience. What would happen if you had a humanity that started to become not just self-aware of the truths, but what if they became enabled? In a new consciousness, I will tell you, there is no fear of rebellion. That is an old consciousness. Instead, the more you pull together in the same kinds of thinking and cooperation, the higher the consciousness becomes on this planet, the better you're going to do. And I'm talking about everything from practicalities of getting along to resources. Can you see it? Can you imagine why this would make a difference and turn a corner? And so the study of today, relationship between the God and the human becomes a model. The more God-like you can become, in even small ways, the more energy is created that you didn't expect that would then affect something else around you. We have described a new axiom, if you wish, a new rule, if you wish, something that only elevated Mature consciousness would even consider, is it possible that two people coming together in love and compassion will create a greater energy than the sum of the parts? And what would that energy then do or become? What if it becomes a field? What if it spills over around you? What if it becomes an invitation for others to see it and accept it? That is new. And we're talking literally about the physics of emotion and the physics of consciousness. And if we're going to do that, right away, we have to talk about the kids. And so for just a moment, before I, I close this channel, I want to address the children. But more than that, I want to address how the children receive you. Their dear ones, is a new consciousness of child on this planet that comes to you more equipped than any time in history for conceptual teaching. And what I mean by conceptual teaching is the change of human nature. You're going to see it first in the children because they're not going to act like you did. 
or the, the ones before you. And we have given all of the reasons why in 30 years. But the difference is going to show clearly on how you train them and how you teach them and what you say. It has been noted by psychologists and biologists that what happens between the age of zero and six sets a model, a stage, that is so profound that it, it lasts all the lifetime of the individual, unless it is then undone or worked on. Sometimes it's very positive, sometimes it is not. But it's such a model that it becomes ingrained almost at the cellular level of children who learn things a certain way. No more profound is it or could be seen better than this example. You're a female, a child, a baby, and you grow up in a family and your father is abusive. It's not good. There's nothing fun about it. And when you're able to leave home and look around and get a mate for yourself, a husband, a lover, a partner, most of the time you select an abusive person. And that, dear ones, doesn't make sense. It's not logical. It makes no sense at all unless you understand the programming that was given to you that said, this is the way it works. What are you going to say to the young ones when you know that their antennas are higher and more receptive than ever before? And I want to give some advice to parents and grandparents. You look in that infant's eyes, so innocent, so ready, so receiving, so beautiful, without bias of any kind except perhaps ancestral, the child is looking to you for influence, to the parent. Parenting can be irritating, and we know that. You have the child growing up in those first six years and saying the same things over and over and wanting to get your attention and yelling when they can't and pulling on your leg and all the things in order to, to say something or be something and it's so easy to become irritated. Let me ask you, is it so easy to become irritated that that's what you always are? And if you're always irritated, the child understands very, very clearly, very quickly that they're not important because they're cast away that every single moment they don't understand the protocol of politeness yet. How compassionate can you be with that? Now listening to this channel probably are far more mature old souls than young ones. That's just the demographics of who is awakening on the planet. But I'm still talking to young parents. And then I'll talk to the grandparents. And to the young parents, I would say, what's the model that you want to show to your children so when they leave your home, they will repeat that model? Because they will. What is it? And all I can tell you that the more loving and patient and compassionate you can be with the child, no matter what they're doing, the more they get it. <clears throat> And you're going to see it almost immediately when they become young adults and have to make decisions finally on their own. They're going to copy them all. And they're going, to, they're going to see the patience and the compassion and they're going to duplicate it. Dear ones, that is called progressive evolution. Generation after generation, they're going to show it to their children. Their children are going to show it to their children. How are you going to set the model? Don't be fooled by that old energy model that you may have been taught. You must have firmness and discipline. They have to know their chalk line. But at the same time, you can do it with logic and you can do it with loving and patience and compassion. So that's all they see. 
They'll see parenting, but they'll see compassionate parenting. If you're a grandparent and you're faced with something so many old souls are, you have grandchildren that you see are being taught dysfunctional things by your own children and their mates. What do you do, grandparent? When the little ones come to you and pull on your sleeve and say this and that and you realize that they're telling you things that their parents told them, perhaps even your children, and not just the, the step, if you understand. What are you going to do with that? Number one, do not make their teaching wrong. Do not tell them any secrets like they're really wrong and here's how it is. Don't do that. That opens a can of worms. I think some of you know. I've told you about energy that is created that you don't expect. If you look in their eyes and you'll say, I love you. God loves you. You can always talk to me. And you can skirt around the issues of who's right or who's wrong because that's not your task. Your task is to show them more compassion than they ever saw before with their parents. And here's what happens. These children are so intuitive. And when they grow up to a place where they're going to have to make decisions, they're going to be knocking on your door, not their parents' door. That ought to give you chills. That's the influence you have. It's not the information you're going to give them, grandparent. It's that which you show them of who you are and what is there. Because they'll always be able to come to you. Always. Even if their parents have become dysfunctional. Even if their parents have, have split. Even if their parents have become disciplinary. Even if their parents have become abusive. The grandparents can undo it. Because for their all the lives, the children know who they can go to for the truth. What are you going to tell your young children about God? From one to six, what model do you give them? I'm not talking about your systems of religion or your doctrines. I'm going to tell you from eyeball to eyeball, you to your children, what do you say? When they're in their cribs looking up at you. Before they've got full full knowledge of, of words and all. they looking at you. What are you going to say? Are you going to think to yourself, well, I'm not going to talk about God. I'm going to wait till they get older. I'm going to take them to the, to the church I'm in. They'll tell them all about it. It's too late. What are you going to say? This is for the young parents. What are you going to tell them when they're in their crib looking at you? And here is the advice I want to give you that's going to change the plan. I want you to tell them that there is a creative source called God or Spirit that loves them more than anything in the world. I want you to tell them they are magnificent in the eyes of the Creator. And that that Creator loves them as much as you do. It sets them on a path of self-empowerment that is not going to result in rebellion. It is not going to result in rebellion, even in your family. It's going to end up resulting in maturity. That's what's happening to the children. They're going to get it. And they begin to understand, no matter what they get later in doctrine, they're smart enough to figure it out, to go with it, not to go with it, but you're going to tell them. That God is love and that they are love. And the angels are all around their crib all the time, even at night, and they're never alone. And they're beautiful in the eyes of the Creator. That's going to change the world. Generation after generation, if you hear these words, that's going to change the world. And that's what the Pleiadians said in this book that was taught so long ago, so profoundly practical today. And so it is.